Get our Bibles out and open them up to Romans 8 and 9. We have two opening passages from those two chapters. And when you find Romans 8, let's stand together for the reading of the Word. We're going to be reading Romans 8, 1 through 4, and then Romans 9, verses 30 through chapter 10, verse 4. Romans 8, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now look over to Romans chapter 9, beginning at verse 30. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it? That is, a righteousness that is by faith? But that Israel, who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness, did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works, they have stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. In verse 1 of chapter 10, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved, for I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Let's pray. Lord, today our hope, our desire, as always, is to learn what your word has to say to us. And may it be translated by your Spirit. May we receive and understand those spiritual words that we can only comprehend because we are believers. And so we thank you for this great gift of being able to know spiritually a spiritual truth the way you have designed it, to receive it in a manner that, that is right and true and to walk in it, Lord. May these things happen so that we would be those who know you better and we would be those who live lives that glorify you all the more. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So this is part three in our study on daily gospel. Oh yeah, that's mine. I'll need that. Our first study, we talked about the definition of the gospel, what is the gospel, and we considered the, the, the spans of it beyond just the simple salvation message. I've always been taught that the gospel is the salvation message, but I've learned that walking through the door, we come into this life with Christ that is huge, that is bountiful, that is wonderful, and there's so much more that the gospel brings to light for us once we are in our faith. And the understanding that it brings, and one of the greatest things that we come to understand in the gospel is the reality of grace and what grace means in my life, what grace means to me, how that affects my life day to day, how that affects the things I think, how that affects my perspective, how that affects the way that I deal with hardship or difficulty or trials. Now, with grace comes a, a paradox because we read through the Bible and, and we learn all this stuff about law and it's hard to understand and, and it doesn't always make sense. And so there's a paradox of grace and law that sometimes stand as a quandary for the Christian. They don't always seem to connect real well. The more we seek to come to terms with it, the more we realize that the logical, common sense path, you know, the one that makes sense, sometimes leads us in the wrong direction where the 
fruits of Jesus' victory are not available to us. But Lord, this path makes sense. It's logical. It's reasonable. But the Lord offers us something that may, might not be logical, a nonsensical, mind-boggling path that leads us to discover the freedom that Jesus has won for us. One makes sense and one doesn't. You know, when we talk about grace, we have to say that it's not fair. That's what makes it grace. It doesn't make sense that we would receive that which we did not earn. It's logical that we would establish a set of morals for ourselves, that we would have rules that we live by in our daily life, that we would develop a list maybe. I've had a list. Do you have a list? You know, if I do these things, then I'm being a good Christian. You know, it's common sense to develop a list. And if we maintain our list, then we can consider ourselves to be good Christians who are in good standing with God. How's your walk, brother? My walk is great. Why? Because I've completed my list. I've done all these things and I've thought the right way and I've rebuked these, these concepts and these ideas that pop up in my head and I haven't acted on them and, and I've done my devotions at the right time and I've, I've given what I'm supposed to give and I've done all these things and I've been nice. So yeah, my standing with the Lord because I've completed my list and I feel pretty good about myself and so I'm spiritual. But if we don't maintain our list, then we would consider ourselves to be in a bad place in the sight of God's disapproving glare. That seems logical. It's like, you know, I didn't do everything on my list that I was supposed to do and, and I kind of feel bad about that. I, I, I didn't, you know, have my devotion time as long as I would have liked to, and then on Tuesday I didn't have it at all, and, and well, I wasn't nice to somebody once, and I did almost kick the dog, so it seems logical that if we want to feel good about our spirituality, that we will work for it, but if we don't work for it, then we will carry a burden of guilt and condemnation. So, how's your walk, brother? Well, I don't know. Let me check my list. So, when we follow this past path of logical spirituality, we're creating a feeling of approval or we're creating a feeling of disapproval based on our own actions. Then what we do is we take those feelings that we have created for ourselves and we attribute them to God. I feel good about myself as being a spiritual person, therefore God is pleased with me. I feel bad about myself because I haven't completed my list, therefore God is not pleased with me. And this is all very logical. It makes sense, doesn't it? It's very reasonable. It's very logical. But there's a transaction of approval and disapproval going on in our life that would be happening whether God was involved or not. Take God out of the equation. The same thing is happening. In fact, many devout religious people operate solely on this principle. They're having both positive and negative religious experiences, and it's perpetuated by an idea or a concept and, and by a set of imposed moral disciplines, actions produce feelings, and then God is brought into the equation as the one whom they will say generated those feelings. This is not to say that spiritual discipline is wrong. I think we are called to be disciplined. In fact, I would encourage a life of spiritual discipline. However, not as a means of feeling or becoming more spiritual or as a means of gaining more favor from God, but rather as a thankful response to the God who has brought us in close by His grace. The Gospel has introduced something to us that is not logical. It is not reasonable. Now, because of the great victory of Jesus over sin and death, it doesn't matter what feeling our internal sense of personal justice creates. It doesn't matter. God's favor is not determined by our list. It is not determined by our level of success or our personal discipline. It is not determined by how many times we did the right thing or the wrong thing. God's favor is determined completely and fully by one thing. And that is the perfection and the holiness of Jesus Christ. He looks upon us favorably because He looks upon His Son favorably. And that's what matters. So he, we find favor in His eyes, even if we ourselves feel like we're not favorable. 
Even if we feel like we've completed our list or we have not completed our list, God looks upon us and sees us in a favorable way because He sees us through Jesus. Now that should change how we think. That should change how we operate. That should change how we consider what we do in life and our heart motive and the things that, that we do in our serving and our giving and our loving. As long as God finds favor in His Son, then He also simultaneously is finding favor in those of us who have received forgiveness and redemption in Him. And that, my friends, is a hard pill to swallow. In fact, to hold on to that concept and ideal, I believe that requires discipline. Because it's easy just to slip back into the easy religious life where if I do my list, I feel spiritual and God is pleased. If I fail in my list, I don't feel spiritual and God is not pleased. It's easy to fall back into that because that's logical. But what's hard is to realize in spite of how messed up we are, God is still pleased. He still loves us fully. You know, that is the stone of stumbling and the rock of offense that God had laid in Zion. Jesus is that stone. And as long as we are those who believe in Him, there is no shame whatsoever. There is no condemnation. We'll come back to that over and over again. For those who are in Jesus, there is no condemnation. Jesus is the end of attaining righteousness by means of the law. Those two things are very important for what we have to say today. Turning your Bibles to John chapter 8. We're going to look at verses 2 through 11. And let's consider here the example of the woman who was caught in adultery and they brought her before Jesus. John chapter 8, beginning at verse 2. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him and he sat down and he taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman, so what do you say? And this they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, let him who is without sin amongst you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and he wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go from now on and sin no more. Don't close your Bible. Keep it there. Focus in on verse 11. Did this woman really commit adultery? We can safely assume the answer is yes. The story says that she was caught in adultery. There's never a denial to this accusation. So we go back to the Old Testament. According to Leviticus Chapter 20, adultery is one of the many sexual sins that call for the consequence of death. The children of Israel were promised great blessing as they went into the promised land. And if you go into the promised land, there will be great blessing. It will drive out the enemies. There will be fruit. There will be great things for you. But according to verses 22 through 26 back there in Leviticus 20, it was dependent upon their obedience to walk in purity, to walk in an upright manner. And the consequences were dire. The stakes were high. The circumstances pertained to the promised land and the consequences for their failure was harsh. So here on this day, before Jesus, they reference back to Leviticus chapter 20. And Jesus did not reply to them according to the letter of the law. Remember, according to Jesus, if you have lust in your heart, then you have committed adultery. If you have hate in your heart, you have committed murder. And thus, Jesus has condemned all mankind as sinful, as broken, as fallen. And the Holy Spirit must, been, must have been at work in the lives of these accusers, those who are older and wiser, caught on earlier than the younger guys. And they're like, this was a mistake. 
And slowly they disappeared. And they gave up. They could not respond when Jesus called those who were without sin to cast the first stone. They just dissolved away, leaving only this accused woman there in his presence. Now the law generally gives a command which is attached to a condition. The, a key word in the law is the word if. You will see that there a lot, if. Paul's favorite example is Leviticus chapter 18, verse 5, for he cites it as an example in both Galatians 3 and in Romans 10. It says in Leviticus 18, 5, you shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules if a person does them, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. That's what's called a conditional promise. The word if is attached. We have a command. If you do them, then we have a condition. You shall live by them. You get back conditionally what you give. And that's what Paul's referring back to. In Galatians 3 and in Romans chapter 10. But in this story of the woman caught in adultery, Jesus is bringing a change to this principle. In verse 10 through 11, it says, Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. There, there's no if there. The if is gone. Is this a commandment with a condition? No, there, it's not. If it were, Jesus would have said, if you go and sin no more, then I won't condemn you. He didn't say that. There's no if here. When Jesus said, neither do I condemn you, it was not a conditional action. There, there were no strings attached. The grace created an unconditional context for this woman to go and to sin no more. And grace is the context that helps us to walk in the ways which are true and right. You know, we've referred back to Titus Chapter 2, verses 10, 11, and 12. And it talks about grace being the thing which trains us, which teaches us to walk in the ways that are upright and true because it gives for us the proper motivation to step forward in the right way. Grace created an unconditional context with, within which she could walk forward and sin no more. Now transfer this principle just for a moment to your own life. Are you condemned? If you are in Jesus Christ, are you condemned? I'll let you answer. No. Thank you. There is no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. We read that passage. None. And the word no in Greek means, you guys are scholars, you know that. So you too are encouraged by Jesus to go and sin no more. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, what if I do sin? What do you mean, what if? You will. Because you're a human. I doubt you'll get out of this building before you think something you shouldn't think. Oh, it happened. Too late. But you're still not condemned. You're still encouraged in your sin to turn back continually and perpetually to the one who says without pause, neither do I condemn you. Now, with the law, there's always a condition. The command is followed by the word if. In the gospel, there is one if that comes into play if we fall into sin. If you want to turn there, you can. It's in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. There is one if. If we do fall into sin, go and sin no more. What if I do sin? You will. No, well, then what? Well, there is an if. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if, there it is, anyone does sin, what's going to happen to us? If anyone says, what's going to happen? Is the hammer going to come down? No, it says, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous. There is no condemnation for those of us who are in Jesus. Jesus is the end of attaining righteousness by means of the law. Now, if you're one of those humans, you know, you're, 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 you're always looking for the angle. You know what I mean? You're like good at the scheming and the scamming. And, uh, you know, maybe you've considered going into, you know, law, being a lawyer or a salesman or something. You're always looking for the angle. 
You might consider the reality of the gospel as being your opportunity to live however you want to. Oh, grace. I see the angle here. I can live however I want to. I can do whatever I want. I can sin freely, whatever, because God's grace is there to forgive me. And you might think that grace is your past to sin freely, knowing that God's forgiveness is continually yours and He approves of you in Jesus. And this is the part of grace that some Christians fear. In fact, some Christians have coined this phrase called cheap grace. Have you heard that term? Cheap grace. And they preach against it because it produces no proper motivation for people to live obedient lives. Well, what produces motivation? Fear. Fear produces motivation. Well, maybe, but not in the gospel. And so when it comes to this topic, the fruit of error pops up but on both sides of the argument. A true understanding of grace will not produce a casual attitude towards sin. I can just do whatever I want. There's the grace of God. A true understanding of grace will not cause a person to respond negatively to it and embrace all the more their ideas and concepts of legalism. If a truth is abused, we should not throw the truth out. Does that make sense to you? But that's our common inclination. Oh, this truth is easily abused and people take advantage of it. So let's just play it safe and let's just, let's just kind of section off that truth. Let's build a wall up around it. Oh, what's behind that wall? Grace. Oh, grace. Yeah, it's wonderful. Is it true? Yeah, it's true. Well, how come there's a wall in front of it? Because you'll probably abuse it. If a truth is abused, we should not throw the truth out in fear that it will be abused again. But this is a common temptation that we are often up against. You know, grace is a truth of the gospel. And because of it, we no longer stand condemned before God. Because of it, we can do nothing to earn the favor that Christ has fully won for us. If people ignorantly use grace as their angle to sin freely, they do it because they are ignorant. They do it because they have little to no regard for the holy God who created them. They do it because they are not concerned with the purpose for which they waited. It is a wonderful thing to live our lives day in and day out with the ever-present reality that we are not condemned by God. And if you are a person like me who is easily given to guilt, man, I can condemn myself in a heartbeat. I am so guilty about things. I grew up feeling guilty about stuff. Man, if I did the slightest thing wrong, I had a stepdad in my life for about four, for about four years. And he had about 7,000 rules that I had to obey every single day. And man, if one of them was wrong, like if I accident, if I thought I need a wrench, but if he finds out that I touch the wrench, he'll be really angry. So I have to put it back just right. And so if I use the wrench, suddenly I felt guilty. Man, I would feel guilty about things. I've told you the story about when I was four years old. You remember I derailed a train, right? Yeah, I've told this story because my mom said, don't go down by the train tracks. That very day, I went down by the train tracks and I put some sticks on the train, just little sticks because I thought, oh, it'd be so cool to see the train break the sticks in half. And that night, the train derailed. Had nothing to do with my sticks. But a train derailed down there and everyone in the neighborhood was walking down to the train tracks and my mom's like, Chad, do you want to come down to the train tracks with us? And I remember sitting in the dark living room. The radio was on, talking about the train derailment. And I was in a rocking chair, rocking, feeling so much guilt. It was horrible. No, I don't want to go. I can do guilt. But God does not lay that stuff on us. There is conviction. There is that which leads us to Jesus. But it's a wonderful thing to live your life day by day knowing that there is no condemnation upon you from God. You are free of it. You know, but what if you didn't fulfill your spiritual to-do list? What if you didn't do everything on it? What if, what if you didn't satisfy your personal conscience or, or, or hold off the tide of your personal guilt? What if you didn't do that? Those are feelings that you're going to have to deal with, but you will need to figure out how to defeat 
these hindrances of the gospel in your life. No matter how much you deal with the guilt, you are still not condemned. Oh, but Lord, I feel really guilty. You're not condemned. Lord, you should not be happy with me. I look upon you favorably. Lord, this doesn't make sense. I know. Grace doesn't make sense. And in this reality, you should find freedom. Not the freedom to sin freely, but the freedom that Jesus has been trying to give to you since the very moment you received his forgiveness. It's a wonderful thing to live our lives day by day with the ever-present reality that we don't have to earn God's favor. Oh, I'll be a better Christian when I earn God's favor more. You know, that, that pressure is upon me. He has taken the economy of man out of the equation. It's not even there. He is fully pleased with you, even if you have wandered off the path, even if you've slipped back into your addiction, even if you have said and done regretful things, even if you've cheated, even if you have lied, even if you've, you've just been lazy and negligent, know this, there are consequences in the flesh for your action, but God looks upon you and you are still in His presence and He still loves you and He still sees Jesus in you and He is pleased with you. That doesn't make sense. That is a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. That is a hard pill to swallow. God is pleased. Not because you earned it, but because Jesus earned it. God is pleased not because you've done good things, but because Jesus is good. And this truth, this reality, doesn't make sense. It makes sense that we would want to earn God's favor, that, that we want to know that we can work hard to get more of His favor. We want to know that. We want to, oh, I'm gonna, I want more of God's favor, so I'm going to work harder. We want to satisfy our sense of justice and think that He is not pleased with us when we sin and, and so that we are motivated by guilt and fear to do the right thing. We want to know that we are able to become more favorable to God than other people. We want to know that we can do that. Oh, God likes you? Well, I'm going to do more things so that He likes me more. We want to know that we can do that, don't we? We like that idea. That sounds good. I like that. But that's not God's way. So when I was 14, 1984, at Ironwood Springs Christian Ranch, I gave my life to Jesus, and I didn't fully understand what that meant, but I knew I had to, and I did. So Jesus was calling, <laughs> and I answered. Thanks for the prop. Perfect timing. And the Lord continues, you know, I still don't get it. Do, do any of you get it yet? Do you, I mean, do you really fully get it yet? You know, I'm still trying to, I'm on the path of trying to figure it out day by day, week by week. And the Lord continues to reveal his brand new mercies to me every morning. Chad, I know you've learned a lot, but I have new things to show you. There's more? Oh, there's always more. There's always more. There's always something new to embrace. There's always a small tradition of man that if we take it and we turn it 27 degrees, suddenly it becomes the biblical truth that it started out as being. And we get to discover those things. There, there's always some doctrinal nuance that, that needs to be seen from a different angle so that we can discover a depth of truth that we only previously knew in a very shallow way. There's something more to learn. You know, our minds are filled with automatic conclusions, you have them. Uh, an idea is brought to you and you said, oh, I've been down this path before. Click, 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 click. It all falls into place. Your process of coming to that conclusion. Here's my conclusion. Ding, it just happened automatically. Our mind is filled with those things. Oh, I know what I believe on that and I've gone through the process before and I'm automatically concluding it. And sometimes instead of letting our biblical conclusions run on, on autopilot, we need to consider afresh without prejudice, without preconceived notion, what God is saying to us. There's always something new to learn. I'm still trying to figure out this wonderful salvation that God has given to me. And it's a very simple truth, 
that I stand before God as one who is not condemned. That's a very simple truth. It's a very simple truth that I can do nothing to earn God's favor. I have it completely and fully. And since that night, on 1984, up there in Minnesota, I have stood unconditionally before God. Since that night, as one who is fully loved, fully forgiven, and in whom God is fully pleased, and nothing has changed. I've learned more. I've grown up. I've matured. I've gained a little bit of wisdom, a little bit. But nothing has changed in those areas. And those simple truths have remained in spite of my, my ups and my downs. I, I didn't understand God's grace, but I was still in it and under it in spite of what I knew. Practically, in my day-to-day -day life, I'm still trying to figure out how this works, but I've learned a few things. I've learned a few things with grace in my life and what it means. You know, I might get stressed out about the physical things in my life. I might still struggle with the call to cast my burdens upon Him. I still want to hold on to my burdens and stress out about them. But when it comes to the reality of my salvation... When it comes to the reality of what it means to stand before my Creator, I'm no longer stressed because I know that He looks upon me and He is pleased. And because of that, I can always stand, I, I can always stand back up when I stumble in my sin. The worst thing you can do is when you fall down or when you stumble in sin is to stay there. The most appropriate thing you can do is stand up and keep walking. Because the only thing that keeps you there is your own guilt, your own personal condemnation. We're not worthy of it, but he encourages us to stand up. Spiritually speaking, the gospel has taught me how to relax. The gospel has taught me the need to keep on walking and to keep on growing. The gospel has shown me the, the parts where my religion is a selfish flesh thing, and that's still in there, and where I need to defy it in obedience to him. The gospel reveals these things to me. The gospel has shown me that no matter where I have failed in my life, I, I cannot fail to receive the grace He's given. Therefore, I'm encouraged to press on. To press on in obedience and in truth towards the high call. The gospel has reinforced in me the appropriate call to live a life of obedience and service to God. As Titus 2.12, I am trained, I am taught by the gospel to walk in the ways of truth and righteousness. Not because I'm blatantly commanded to with a warning of conditional consequences, but rather because He loves me. And to understand that, well, that's enough. The gospel also makes us citizens of a new kingdom. And that's liberating because I don't know if you've noticed, but the kingdom we live in now, it's kind of stinky. Have you noticed that? Our government. Kind of stinky. Corruption amongst leaders all over the world. Like every governmental system, this is some kind of thing that's really messed up and broken because people have a hard time doing things right, especially when power is involved. And so the gospel says, okay, I know you live in that country and do your best to honor the laws of that nation and, and be respectful and, and do what you need to do to be a good citizen. There's that encouragement in the Word. But there's also this freedom in knowing that I'm a citizen of a different kingdom. Not this one, of a different kingdom. And it's a spiritual reality that instills within us a hope of a physical reality which is yet to come. You know, in our next study series, we're going to talk about the daily kingdom. What does it mean to be citizens in God's kingdom? Is the kingdom of God something that we simply wait for because we know that it will be manifest physically in the future? Or is it a reality that helps to govern our lives right here and now as we are spiritual citizens of it? Like many of you, I always thought the gospel was simply a salvation thing. But hopefully we're learning together that man, it's part of our daily life. It's part of who we are. It should manage the way we think and perceive and understand. It should help us overcome our guilt and our condemnation. 
It should help us press forward and love one another and, and to know that so much has been extended to us that, that it also should be extended to others. A true understanding of the gospel will make it very difficult for us to hold a grudge. Really. Really difficult for the grudge to hold on. Because we realize what he's done for us. And it helps us to do that for others. The prophesied life, message, death, and resurrection of Jesus. It isn't just a door. But it's the door that leads into an amazing life of experiencing and being motivated by the grace of God.